American University in Bulgaria. So please join me in welcoming Professor Price. I'm going to just stand. I find it easier to stand. Um, talking, and I also I couldn't see some of you in the back when I was sitting, so I, I apologize for kind of um, jumping off like this. Um, I, I want to talk about the topic that you've seen, Wither the Arab Spring, to try to focus a little bit on why there is such turmoil in those six countries now that held out so much promise um, in 2010 and after for a, democrat, a democratic transition. You'll remember that when in Tunisia um, protests broke out against the government of the day um, and then the government of the day was removed and elections held, a new constitution began to be drafted. It's not yet drafted. Um, Tunisia was the first of the six countries that we normally think about when we think about the Arab Spring in the Middle East and, and North Africa. But the promise of that democratic transition this was called a democratic revolution, you might remember, back in 2010, 2011. The promise of that prospective revolution um, has clearly not been delivered. You, if you're following the news on uh, about each of these countries, these six countries, you'll notice that in every single one of them, there is a substantial amount of political turmoil, a substantial amount of protest, in a number of cases of substantial violence, think about Syria, one of those six countries now embroiled in the civil war that I'm sure you're following fairly closely um, in the news, and even Egypt, the second of the six Arab Spring countries following Tunisia, Egypt, as you well know, has now reverted to military rule when Mohamed Morsi was removed from power. The duly elected, democratically elected, um, president of Egypt, removed from power by the military, with the really support of liberals in Egypt. Uh, a lot of liberal Egyptian support, small L liberal Egyptian support for this military coup in, in, um, in Egypt. So just taking those two cases, we begin to see some of the variation in outcomes that have occurred among these six countries. Just to say a little bit more about the six before I try to delve a little more deeply, um, in addition to Tunisia and, and Egypt and Syria, some countries you may not be following very closely, Yemen, for example, Bahrain um, uh, 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 as, as well. What's the, the last one of the six, do you remember? Libya. Yes, Libya. And Libya is an interesting case as well because in many instances, it looks, I think, in the, on the outside, um, as reasonably successful. There is no civil war now, um, uh, even though there are, of course, as you know, people um, blockading the oil ports in Libya, disrupting the sale and the distribution of oil, disgruntled workers, for example, disgruntled militias in Libya, but the overt massive violence that so characterized that place um, until recently no longer exists. But in Libya, Libya is one of at least two failed states among those six Arab Spring countries. There is really um, no serious unified national military, no serious unified, nation, unified police. Most of the, of the rule of, uh, the monopoly of force, so to speak, is by militias, um, by militia groups which are not knitted into any sort of national military or police force. So if you take as one characteristic of an effective functioning state, one of them is the ability to monopolize the use of force, and that capacity does not rely in the state located in Tripoli in Libya um, at this point. And the other element of an effective state is the capacity to make laws, to make rules, and to implement them. And that clearly, in the absence of a monopoly of force by the government in Tripoli, does not exist there either. So 
not only is Libya a failed state, even though not embroiled in violence right now, but Syria clearly, by definition, because it's embroiled in the civil war, is a failed state as well. And we could, we could look further across those, those six countries and begin to see that, that to some degree, Bahrain could be called a failed state using those two criteria of monopolizing um, the use of force and capacity to make and implement laws. Um, Bahrain might be, Yemen possibly might be, even though in both cases we don't have a civil war of the Syrian extent. So this, the promise, I think, of the Arab Spring clearly not um, realized um, so far. Political tor turmoil across each of those, each of those uh, countries. Um, you might, just to take you to Tunisia for a moment, just to give you one more example of the kind of turmoil I'm talking about. In Tunisia, there are protests on the streets yet again, calling for the resignation of the Inadi party-led government. It's a moderate Islamist government, um, but the complaint is that that government has done far too little <coughs> to rein in the militias which operate there as well in the absence of a unified policing force, professional policing force. And as well, that government has not been able to deal with the economic downturn, the economic underperformance that has bedeviled um, uh, the Tunisians for years, and that led to the original um, protests that, that, that uh, created the Arab Spring there. So different situations in different countries. But the same story overall in all cases, political dysfunction, political and, um, and, uh, and political, political violence, and as a consequence, failed promises of this potential democratic revolution in this part of the world. So I'm not going to say a lot about each of the six countries. You know, I think it would be difficult to do justice to each of them. We can talk about them individually if you want um, during questions. But what I want to do now is to draw a, a few conclusions that can sort of set the stage for a broader conversation. Um, and one of the, 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 the sort of conclusions I want to draw is um, to try to explain why it is that promise has led to turmoil. So what then can we say about the reasons for the, the breakdown in this transition that we hoped would lead to democracy? And I, I think the first thing that we need to keep in mind is that in each of these six countries, there is, there was and there is, a substantial lack of political capacity um, of, even before the protests um, began, of the capacity of these governments to deliver on economic reform, um, to deliver on educational reform, to deliver on um, uh, appropriate housing, um, to do the kinds of things that the, um, the populations that are exploding in this part of the world require. Um, and in particular, to provide jobs to the very young populations that live in those six countries. These are, these are they're, they're, the population explosion in, these, in this part of the world has led to a, a very young, um, a very large number of very young people under 25 years old, many of whom have, even before the Arab Spring, had difficulty finding jobs. And, and since the Arab Spring, the difficulties have become even worse because of the dysfunction created by the protests and the governmental responses. So political capacity measured by the ability to solve problems, whether they be economic or political, to design a new constitution, for example. In each of these countries, I would have to catalog each of them, but I don't think in any of the six countries in which these protests originally took place in 2010 and 2011, I don't think that any of them yet has a fully promulgated, written new constitution to deliver new political rules designed to resolve the problems that led to the protests in the first place. So, so political incapacity, I think, is one of the characteristics that, that has made it very difficult to, live, to deliver on the, on the sort of promises of the, of the past. There's another uh, problem as well. In some of these countries, and I'm thinking particularly about 
Syria, and about Egypt. The military itself is a problem, and I suspect this is not news to any of you. Um, certainly the Egyptian military has turned out to have uh, weaker democratic credentials than we might have expected, um, to be far too willing to intervene um, to undercut uh, President Morsi. Sorry. Um, in other words, to revert to its usual practices of toppling governments that seem to be threatening its central principle of secularism. So when secularism comes under challenge, as it did by Morsi, who is a moderate Islamist of the, of the, of the, uh, is, of the Muslim Brotherhood, when that happens, the military has traditionally um, become concerned and intervened in the political process. The same thing happened um, most recently um, uh, in Egypt. So a strong military with limited democratic commitment and a, and a history of political intervention reasserts itself um, given the ineffective of the ineffectiveness of the Morsi government. You'll remember that in Egypt under Morsi, um, joblessness continued. You will remember that in the Egypt under Morsi, under Morsi, Sunnis living in Egypt had very little confidence that the Morsi-led moderate Islamist government of the Muslim Brotherhood would in fact protect its interests in addition to the interests of Islamists. So there was no real sense in Egypt of mutual security um, that opponents of the Morsi government would in fact, of, of the moderate Islamic government, would in fact be given um, the same privileges um, as everyone else in the country. So a history of discrimination against Islamist, against the Muslim Brotherhood in the Egypt um, of the past, became a continued history of perceived discrimination at least um, by Islamists now in power against Sunni liberal secularists who were suddenly, as a result of democratic elections, no longer in power. That pattern of discrimination, lack of trust, lack of mutual security didn't change um, when the Morsi government was elected a year ago in, in, um, in Egypt. Um, so two things going on. The history of the military in Egypt and its reasserting itself and the lack of mutual security between opponents and supporters of the old regime in Egypt. And I think that um, clearly we're seeing this in Syria as, as well. The Syrian military, against, again, largely loyal to President Assad, the, the free Syrian um, military of former officers who, who resigned from the ranks of the Syrian military and became part of the opposition is very small. Um, is, legit, is recognized by the international community, but is, has no substantial power. And in Syria, the other problem is that the opposition is so fragmented, the Free, Syri the Free Syrian military, but as well other armed militias in various parts of the country, fragmented opposition and a military which in the face of this, I think, um, could well reassert itself under the leadership of President Assad, depending on what happens. And you all probably know that the UN has just issued its report saying that the Assad regime, the military regime of Assad, in fact, probably did um, uh, use sarin gas on the 1,400 people who were, 1,400 people who were killed and, and many others who were seriously injured. So in the two of the six cases then, military itself is a bit of, of the problem. If we turn to the other side of the table, to Tunisia, which by the way I should say is for me probably the most optimistic of the six cases. I have the most hope that there can be some sort of gradual turn toward a, a liberal democratic future there. Um, in Tunisia, the military is rather different. Um, the, there is a reasonably strong military apparatus in Tunisia, but it has, has been traditionally fairly apolitical, does not have a history of, of coups. And so when the, the protests of 2011, late 2010, early 2011 broke out, the Tunisian military did not, could not be mobilized 
um, to crush the protesters, which is one of the reasons why the president um, ultimately um, resigned and fled the country. So if you're beginning to think about why it is that the outcomes in each of these six cases are rather different, one question to ask yourself is what is the strength and the position um, and the solidarity, the, uni the, the unity of the military in each of those, in each of those countries. That's gonna be a key factor that will help decide what happens um, in the future. Um, so, as we think a little bit further about why promise has turned into, into turmoil, I've said the military is one, is one factor, the lack of political capacity is another factor, and I've intimated a third factor, and that is the complete disunity, by and large, of the opposition to the old regime in many of, in many of, these, in many of these countries. Um, it's one thing to break the back, as it were, of, a, of an authoritarian regime. Um, it's another thing to design a new, a new political order um, and, to, and to, to create new rules that can then be implemented um, of this new political order. That takes a level of political organization, um, cooperation and coherence among opposition groups, among the new Democrats, as it were, that is by and large missing in each of those six, in each of these six countries. Egypt, I think, has been among the most positive of those, of those cases, though. The Muslim Brotherhood, the, the party, the, the movement whose political party became the main party in the, in the Morsi government, popularly elected in Egypt, Muslim Brotherhood has been a, a clear exception. It, it's well organized, um, it has a history of, of being able to mobilize supporters, of being able to deliver on, um, on social goods like um, uh, health care and social services to its citizens. Um, it has a long history in Egypt of pretty coherent political thinking and the capacity to implement a lot of its goals. But the problem with this strong movement and political party is that it had not learned to reach out to, to, up to the opposition. It had, it, it, because of its years of living in secrecy, um, you know, for self-protection, had not, I think, learned to have uh, an approach that, that was inclusive. And that meant that Sunnis, when faced with this Shia, you know, is, is Islamic, uh, sorry, uh, that secularists in um, Egypt, when faced with uh, this Islamist <coughs> Muslim Brotherhood-led government, had no trust in this government. And in fact, many of the steps that Morsi began taking toward the end of his year in office as president reinforced the fears of secularists um, because he began acting in ways that many people interpreted as sectarian, as, as, as tilting toward Islamists, tilting away from um, the more secular goals of the rest of the population. So um, while I would say that the Muslim Brotherhood, I think, had real promise as a way of unifying the opposition to the old regime, I think in many ways the Morsi government failed to realize this promise because it hadn't learned the lesson of inclusion, which is one of the important things one needs to do in mobilizing toward a democratic, um, democratic future. I'll say just as an aside, I think the Muslim Brotherhood in a number of other countries, um, because as you know, this is not just an Egyptian-based movement, also as a relatively moderate Islamist um, movement with, with its political parties, has promise as a potential fulcrum for um, positive democratic change in a, a number of countries in the Middle East. Um, but I'm afraid the, the failure of the Morsi government, the actions of the Egyptian military against it, may in fact push Muslim Brotherhood, both in Egypt and elsewhere, into much more defensive behavior in the short run. You know probably in Egypt that the Brotherhood is being viciously um, uh, suppressed by, by the regime. P people jailed, 
um, <coughs> real fear for their lives of a, of a number of members of the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, brotherhood owned businesses, that is individuals who are known by their neighbors to belong to the Brotherhood, businesses being ransacked, Brotherhood members and Islamists in general in Egypt being, being called terrorists by their neighbors. Um, it's really, I'm afraid at this point, quite a, a vicious situation. This is not good if we're interested in the future of democratic change in this region because I think the Muslim Brotherhood has to be taken seriously as a potential actor, um, a potential organizer of an effective um, uh, democracy going forward. Given the, the breadth of its support, um, I think this has to be taken seriously. Um, I think that for now is all I want to say about some of the reasons for the, the, the turmoil. There may be other things that come up in the conversation, but I want to draw some quick conclusions overall about what we can um, expect in the future. And of course, the short story is who knows? <laughs> it's, just, it's just not possible to know. There's too much volatility. There are too many um, factors to weigh here. And of course, the people of these countries are busy making their own future. Um, and we will just have to see what they decide. We'll have to see what the, what the outcomes um, are. So I'm just going to make some broad points that may help us begin to think about um, a possible future. And they will be very general points drawn heavily from the literature on democratic transitions, some of which your country has in fact contributed to. Um, because you were, you, you, those of you who are at least Bulgarian by birth are in a country that has been very much part of this important Central East Europe democratic transition. And the political science literature draws on that heavily in thinking about um, other kinds of democratic transitions to come. You probably know as well that this democratic transitions literature in political science also draws on the changes in the mid-1970s in Latin America and, and um, Spain and Portugal and Greece in South Europe. So these two democratic transitions have led political scientists to make generalizations about when such transitions are likely to occur, when they're likely to be successful. And my claim is that we can use that literature in thinking about, in thinking about the Middle East, in thinking about these six countries and any others that might in the future begin to tilt in a more democratic um, direction. In other words, I don't think the Middle East is a place apart. I think it's a, it's a part of the world that can be understood comparatively um, in, in, in a context framed by the transitions that you've gone through and that the Southern Europeans and Spain at all have actually gone through. So what kinds of broad um, points might we draw from this literature that could be applicable to, um, to these countries of the Middle East and North Africa? One, I think, um, is that I don't think we can call these, these changes democratic revolutions at all. In fact, I'm not sure Arab Spring is the right word to use. I, I don't think we're fully understanding what's going on here. For me, these are, um, uh, these have really been regime crises. That is, authoritarian regimes clearly unable to control their political space in the way they used to, uh, challenged by their own people, a regime crisis. That's a very different thing from a democratic revolution, right? Regime crisis is, is breakdown or weakening of authoritarian hold on citizens. Democratic revolution suggests real positive democratic rules of the game being created and implemented, at least potentially. And I just don't think that the latter is all that um, much in evidence, except perhaps in Tunisia. If you're, if you're not focusing on Tunisia very much, I'm certainly no Tunisia expert myself, I find that a very interesting country, quite promising. But in other cases, probably, probably um, not. Um, the other thing that I would suggest um, uh, from this literature um, is that 
mutual security is going to be paramount as a goal to be attained in these countries if any kind of a political future um, is to be um, created. In other words, the fear that we see in Egypt, obviously in Syria, but elsewhere in the, in the countries I've been talking about, that, that if my opponent wins an election, I will therefore be in the political wasteland practically forever, and my economic prospects will be, will be affected. That kind of insecurity that comes to losers cannot persist in a democratic country. I mean, democracies, liberal democracies, are premised on the notion that one can lose and still um, rise to win a future election, and that one's financial and personal prospects won't be devastated by a loss. That sense that you can lose and still come back to win again and, and prosper is part of the mutual security that's fundamental to any liberal democracy, and I don't really see that existing in any of these countries so far, I think it's going to have to be created. And it's going to be um, very difficult. Just a word related to this broad point about mutual security. The democratic transitions literature makes a very large point that in Southern Europe, Spain, etc., these transitions happened because the democracies were pacted. Um, the, Authoritarian dictators of those of those countries um, were deposed, and the supporters of, of that regime agreed with the opponents, with the Democrats. They packed it. They came together to agree on a transition to a democratic future. If you think about Spanish politics and the role that the King Juan Carlos played in this, and the first and second prime ministers of Spain in the mid 70s you will see how this story of pacted democracy, of cooperation between the old regime and the new, the new hoped for democratic um, activists uh, uh, took place. And that's been fairly much the case in Southern Europe. In your part of the world, in, in Central East Europe, the argument goes, these were not transitions that were pacted, these were transitions in which there were clear winners and losers, at least in the successful cases of democratic transition. And most people consider Czech, the Czech Republic and Hungary, um, the Baltics, Poland, to be probably the most successful cases. This is a literature that's now about 10 years old. You might want to challenge that, those conclusions. But that argument about the CEEs goes on to say, what happened there is that the successful transitioners to democracy were successful because the Democrats, the opponents of the old regime, were hegemonic. There was simply no question that, de that there was a massive popular and elite consensus in favor of democratic change and of implementing the rules that would enable that to take place. And the, the, the proponents of the old regime, the old communists, were simply outflanked, outnumbered. Um, and so there were clear winners and losers. Now, on to the six countries of the, of the Arab Spring. I don't think we really see either operating in this, in this part of the world, in the Middle East at this point. There is clearly not pacted, um, there's no pact at all, and there are clearly no winners and losers, I think, in any of these cases. So I think what we're seeing then in these six Arab Spring countries, where there isn't civil war and there isn't a military takeover, is indeterminacy, um, obviously. Um, it is simply, there's much more of a stalemate between um, liberals and Democrats, and they're not always the same people, or they're not, and they don't always want the same thing, and uh, uh, proponents of the, of, the, of the current authoritarian regimes. Um, I, 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 there's, there's stalemate, it's simply not clear what's going to happen. And so the consequence in the face of the other more environmental problems in the Middle East, environmental degradation, joblessness, um, economies that are mainly based on oil and not based on the creation of, of um, efficiency and effectiveness in, in, in other parts of the economy, and imbalanced economies, in other words. Um, all of this 
I think these environmental issues, the absence of rule of law, are going to make the situation highly volatile for the foreseeable future. Um, and I think very, very difficult to predict. So, I don't know how long we took, yeah. but... An hour? We're okay. ready to kick off the question, the Q&A part of, uh, yeah. of the talk. Who would like to ask a question? Or, or challenge? Or, or, or yes, or, or, or make a comment. <coughs> yeah. Thank you very much for coming and uh, sharing your time with us. As a representative of the country from Central Asia, in 2005 and 6 we had the same kind of revolutions as in the Arab Spring, uh, the revolutions in Ukraine, Georgia and Kurdistan. We were kind of following each other in a, in a short time basis and uh, as some experts refer to as a colorful revolutions. Can we draw any comparisons between those two events that took place in post-Soviet countries and in Middle East, and uh, which part we can consider as successful. So you, uh, now you're asking for, for an extension of this analysis to Central Asia? Yes, yeah, comparison of Arab Spring and those colorful revolutions that took yeah. place in... Uh, and I'm afraid I just have not studied the Central Asian um, you know, <coughs> revolutions at all, so I, there's not very much I can offer. But you may be able to add something here. I mean, do you have some insights about the potential comparison? Well, I mean, uh, as a person from Kyrgyzstan, for instance, we had a revolution in 2005, mm -hmm. and we thought, yeah, it's going to be fine, but the person who came instead of our former president, uh, he pushed his own agenda, and it was more totalitarian as well, mm -hmm. and then at the end, in five years, we ended up with another revolution, and now we are like, living with it, and considered, considered as most democratic country in Central Asia, I don't know whether it's true or not, mm -hmm. and uh, just wanted to learn your opinion on that. Mm -hmm. Well, as I say, I, I simply am, I just don't have the knowledge I need of that region, but I have a general observation, which is it sounds to me very much like a case of continued stalemate, and, and I will say that in the world in general, something has changed that makes it harder for um, dictators and, and for regimes that we might call security states, where a lot of the resources of the state are focused on maintaining internal security and not necessarily on doing a lot else for their people. I think it's harder and harder to maintain those security states, those internal security states. It, in part because of the, inter, in large part, because of the internet. And you will remember the role of, of the internet um, in the Arab Springs. You know, people tweeting one another so that to, to crowdsource a protest. Um, that's, it, we can get carried away with this analysis that internet technology is changing politics. But I do think the capacity for members of the public to communicate with one another in a way that is not readily controllable by the regime is extremely powerful. <coughs> and I think may, is one of the reasons why um, security state regimes are finding it more and more difficult to control um, their own people. And I would say, in general, something else has changed, which I think affects Central Asia less than it does parts of the Middle East. But the old Cold War consensus where the Soviet <coughs> Union and the United States kind of divided up much of the world and maintained order in their sphere of influence um, because of the desire of both of those powers to maintain their, their dominance, that's ended. You know, the, the, the end of the Cold War has meant that the incentives for Russia and for the United States to, to maintain the kind of presence in the Middle East in particular, I think are reduced, um, particularly for the United States. And so the absence of this hegemonic interest in stability um, in the Middle East has been one of the reasons why um, dict uh, dictatorial regimes there have less support from, from either of their, of, their, of their patrons. And there's something else that's going on too in the Middle East that may have an impact on Central Asia. Oil prices rise and fall. Um, many of these regimes and some of the Central Asian regimes are very much oil dependent. 
I think it's increasingly clear that to have an economy that's going to function, even in heavily um, oil-rich countries, you have to diversify your economy. And that lesson, I think, is, is being learned as well. In the absence of an assured um, level of revenue from oil, um, security state regimes are more insecure. Um, it's, they're less able to depend on a, a, you know, a solid flow of revenue to enable them to control their own people as they, as they might. So, so I think the environmental and political conditions in which these dictatorships with, with strong security apparatuses could thrive has to some degree disappeared, not entirely, but somewhat. And I think some of this may well be, I'm guessing, um, may augur that things could change in Central Asia, in Kyrgyzstan, in the future, maybe not now, but in the future, particularly if students and young people continue to mobilize. Anything you want to add to this? Just oh. <coughs> Um, thank you very much for coming. Um, do you believe that third party involvement is necessary, or do you think that the states should just uh, transition to democracy on their own? I think um, that's a great question. And I, you've been reading some political science, I think. I, I, you're, you're sounding like someone who has read some of the literature on peacemaking um, in divided societies, um, a big political science literature on that. Um, I think. It all depends, and it depends on the kind of third party involvement. Um, and so this could lead to some conversation about Syria, and I'll put that aside. But, but in general, a, a lot of this literature, and I've contributed some to this literature, suggests that in cases where there is um, stalemate between um, opposition between, say, government and opposition, or between warring parties, um, where neither of the two parties can trust one another, um, and so neither of the two parties can give up its arms or give up its opposition because it's too afraid of what will happen to it, of what the other, what its opponent will do to it. That's mutual insecurity, right? I've talked about mutual security in democracies, but one of the things that keeps um, conflicts, internal conflicts in countries and regions going is mutual insecurity. Third parties can be a helpful tool <coughs> in helping to create at least some mutual security by creating, by constraining the, the, the capacity of one party to hurt the other or to renege on promises to the other by creating, in, a, in other words, what people call credible commitments, um, binding commitments to peace or at least to cooperation. So I'm getting into sort of political science ease, but the bottom line is I do think that where protection of both parties is needed so that they can at least feel that they can take the first steps towards some kind of negotiation um, that's where third parties can come in. And in general, I think those third parties tend not to be individual states. Mm -hmm. um, maybe the UN sometimes can be a party. The Gulf Cooperation Council to be, to be um, the Arab League. I would love to see the Arab League doing much more. There are reasons why it can't, but I think potentially the Arab League could be an important third party. In some cases in Syria now, maybe the United States and Russia, given the new plan to, to put under UN, to, to have the UN or UN-related groups destroy chemical weapons, that could be an important part of third-party involvement. Third-party involvement in, 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 the, in, as, in the form of military intervention, I, I mean, I'm a little less enthusiastic for various reasons. Is that? Okay. There was a question at the back. Yeah, I actually have two questions. Um, now, the first one might seem a bit silly, but it, it is fundamental and nobody has answered <laughs> it. So do you really think that democracy is uh, the way for uh, those countries? Is that the best system that they can choose, given the fact that they have no history of it? 
given the fact that there are religious strifes and battles between the two different groups, Shiites and Sunni. So do you think that democracy is the, is the answer? Um, and my second question is, um, you mentioned about research being done on South America, Central and Eastern Europe, and how that can be used and is applicable to uh, the Middle East. Um, do you really think that is the case since we have an added factor in the Middle East, which is religion. Mm -hmm. So we have we didn't have any problems in Eastern Europe connected with Catholicism or Orthodox, mm -hmm. the Orthodox Church. Um, the same was the case in uh, uh, Southern America. Mm -hmm. So there the position was, is it democracy or is it authoritarian rule? Mm -hmm. Whereas in the Middle East we have democracy versus authoritarian rule and then religion, um, Islamist versus secular government. So it's, this is an added dimension, mm -hmm. which kind of complicates things. So can it be really applicable? I think these are both great questions. I'm going to start with the one I remember best, which is the second one. <laughs> and you can refresh me on the first one. Um, but the second one, um, I do think what, this literature on democratic transitions is very clear that in, in places where there are deep sectarian, religious, ethnic, whatever the divisions, that those deep divisions um, do make it very difficult to have a successful transition to democracy. You can see why, because, the, because it's hard to, to create a democratic consensus when groups are it's such, have such a deep held distrust for one another. And that condition of sectarian division, and sometimes it's sectarian, sometimes it's religious, in the Middle East is very, very real. But in Tunisia, there aren't really substantial sectarian and religious uh, differences. Um, uh, the Berbers are an ethnic community in Tunisia who would like to be, to, to, who, who don't want to be discriminated against, but Tunisia is a country where there seems to be a substantial amount of national trust. Um, and so I do think that, the, that there are different, that countries are very different in the Middle East, and that the conditions in one are not the same as the conditions in the other. So I would say in some cases, I do think there's a, a prospect for democracy because the sectarian religious divide is not hugely strong. Elsewhere, Egypt would be another case where, again, Egypt has, has until recently not been a country with huge um, religious divisions. Egypt is predominantly Sunni, as you, as you know. It has Christians and Copts and others, but Sunni Islam is the, is the predominant religion. What has happened, sadly, though, is a consequence of the military takeover and the, and the, um, the, the, pro the persecution of, of the Muslim Brotherhood, is that now sectarian divisions are beginning to open up between, um, between secularists and supporters, secularists who support the military regime, old school folks who support the military regime, um, and some moderate Islamists who support the military regime because they want political order, and they know the military regime is probably the only body that can produce it. And Islam, uh, Islamists of the Muslim Brotherhood stripe and more radical Islamists. That divide between the two camps is deepening. Um, as you can see by the illustrations I gave earlier of the kinds of names that people are throwing out to one another. So conflict itself, physical fear and persistent physical violence between groups can, can deepen um, sectarian religious differences that may not have been deep at all in the case of, of Egypt until, um, until now. So uh, short story, different outcomes in different places depending on, on, on the, on the the degree of, of, um, of, of difference. What was your first question? Is democracy the answer in uh, those countries? And this, this is, you know, an, as an American coming from a country that I consider to be a very ideological country in which we kind of put democracy, I, are there, I don't know, yeah, yeah. And so you can, you can challenge me on this, but one of my critiques of the United States um, is that we tend to, to see democracy, big D, as the answer to everything, and you know, and ourselves, of course, as the preeminent de Democrats. And I just think that's not true. 
And so, and I don't think democracy is the answer to everything. And I do think that countries will need to find their own way. But I do think a lot of people living in the six countries I've been talking about want at least liberalization. And by that I mean, uh, you know, um, rule of law, fair treatment, end to discrimination, ability to feel safe because the police and the army treats people fairly, ability to earn a living um, because the government can keep order in a way that will make that possible. This is really what I would call liberalization, courts that work effectively to protect contracts and to protect individual liberty. And that can come without democracy. You don't absolutely have to have elections. You know, we can, in the United States, democracy and elections are equated. Democracy in its full-blown sense is about much more than elections. It's about being able to provide those liberal underpinnings of rule of law and personal freedom. And the one can happen without the other. So I would say that what I read people in many of these countries asking for, or at least the protesters, is liberalization and not necessarily elections. Um, and, and, so, and so I would say I would listen to people there and listen to what they are saying. And then, in, you know, and so for me, liberalization is the answer because in part that's what people there, uh, protesters are, are saying. And because I think our comparative and historical evidence suggests that where liberalization has, has, has taken hold, even if it proceeds, if it comes before elections, things go a lot better. Elections first is often, I think, a recipe for disaster. Um, other questions, comments? Uh, I think he raised a great point when it comes to democracy in the Middle East. Uh, when we look at the, not necessarily democracy for elections, but democratic values and liberal values, mm -hmm. it has a long history in Europe. It started with the French Revolution, and the concept uh, human rights as such became a value only after two world wars. So it's been a process of, uh, and it's been a process of violence, and that's how we got to the Western values and best Western democracies. Now we try to judge Middle East, which, we, which has been under the authoritarian rule for like decades, if not centuries. Mm -hmm. We got the turnover of the government and then we are judging them against um, Western democratic and liberal values that they never really had to mm -hmm. deal with before. And I think it's unfair to judge them according to these values and then to call them failed states because when we look at the Europe, it's been a violence that led us to uh, appreciate human rights, appreciate the majority rule, uh, for example. So uh, it's not necessarily the failed state, but I think it's a process towards liberalization mm -hmm. maybe, that they need to get there themselves, like to appreciate different ideas, to appreciate human rights, but it does not come just like that mm -hmm. after one day of turnout, you know? It's, they have, I think they have to go through with this process. And I'm from Georgia and same with my country. Mm -hmm. We do not have democratic values as such. We do not have culture of democracy at all. So I think it's just a process that countries need to go through to get there. So I think it's just unfair to call them failed states just because they could not elect the, the government. Right. I, I, I could not agree with you more about the historical, the, lo the long length of time it's taken to get to um, liberal democracy in the places where it exists. I don't know if you've read Charles Tilley's wonderful work about the 17th century in Europe, um, state making and war making in um, <coughs> European politics, roughly, is the title. I mean, it is clear, his argument is, that, that the creation of strong states in um, parts of Western Europe in particular, in the west part of Western Europe, came through war. Um, war making was a form of state making. And in many ways one could argue that there are probably elements of that going on in the Middle East, East now. So I absolutely agree with your, with your point there. The one thing I want to just clarify is my use of this term failed state. It's a pretty precise term used in the political science literature to refer really to the, to, to the capacity of a state, not to its values, but to the capacity of a state to, to, to create order and maintain it. The monopoly of the use of force is the 
baby Aryan term that's used, and then secondly, to make and enforce laws to be actually to be able to govern. But particularly when a state loses its monopoly of the use of force, for example, it can't control what armed militias do in its own borders. Mm -hmm. That's quintessentially the mark of a failed of a of a failed state, regardless of the kinds of values that might be endorsed by people. But it still com comes with the culture of the society itself to enforce the laws, to make the laws, and to enforce right. so that people who are under the control right. will obey the, the law. So right. it goes with the, I think it goes with a right. kind of state culture. I, I agree, but I don't think it's all about culture. I think it's also about power, about the power of a state. And I'll give you an example. Um, 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 I'm trying to remember, uh, I'm just forgetting the example I was going to bring up. Um, I th it's it's in, in Syria, for example, at this point, given the Syrian civil war, that, that already is evidence, quintessential evidence, that Syria is a failed state, so we don't have to go any further. But at the same time, uh, in the case of Syria, the fact that it no longer controls its own territory, um, it parts of its own territory, the opposition, the armed militias, the Syrian Free Army are controlling a certain amount of the territory of what used to be Syria. That's an example of state failure. It's incapacity to control its own territory. Um, in the case of Iraq, for example, after um, the first Iraq war, when Saddam Hussein was still in power, but the international community was trying to protect the lives of the Kurds in the north part of, of Iraq. There, were, there was an, uh, an international US-led flyover um, over Iraqi airspace in both the north part of Iraq and the south part of Iraq where Shia lived to protect, to make sure that, the, um, that Hussein's um, planes could not strafe the Kurds and the Shia from the air. That's the loss, that's an, another example of state failure, the loss of the ability to control your own territory. So monopoly of use of force, capacity to control your own territory, these are kind of the operational <laughs> indicators here. If I can uh, intervene, as, uh, as far as I understood, you would advocate only a limited international intervention uh, in a post-revolutionary uh, Arab state, it's only diplomatic intervention. But what will happen if the result of these revolutions is just failed states or with no effective control of or, or the organized violence or uh, intercommunal wars? What will happen? I think it's, it's a. I think it's a very difficult situation, and again, I think it would be case by case. Just to jump into Syria for a minute, because that would be, you know, obviously at the forefront of our of our minds. Um, it, it it does seem to me that in um, a case like Syria, armed intervention is very difficult, and that's one of the problems. In a situation where there are multiple armed and competing groups, and the level of violence is very high. It's very hard to intervene effectively um, to end the violence and then to reestablish order and then to rebuild. Um, so I think, I think armed intervention becomes very problematic and has to be used judiciously. In Syria, for example, it does seem to me, I'm not endorsing this, but it does seem to me possible, however, that if the Russian-American, mainly Russian plan, for locating chemical weapons, that's a kind of intervention. There would have to be armed, there would have to be armed people on the ground to make that happen, by the way. Highly unlikely. But that at least seems to me to be a justifiable way of intervening using arms. Um, beyond that, I think it's, it's quite difficult. The UN has discovered in other cases where there are competing groups, an internal war in a country, um, has found it very difficult to intervene until the two groups or the three have agreed to put down their arms, at least temporarily, and then the United Nations can come in and sort of monitor the peace and keep the groups 
um, apart. It's very difficult for the UN or other peacekeeping group to come in the middle of organized violence and engage. And there should be at least a truce or ceasefire right. right. before this to can separate happen. warring parties by right. force. Right. Right. If and, that can and happen, and then I think. <coughs> I yeah, what I meant was rather something that has been tried in Afghanistan, for example, where this counterinsurgency strategy that would involve uh, the, uh, the reform of the security uh, institutions of the mm -hmm. country, support for civil society, mm -hmm. development assistance, combined various methods, mm -hmm. uh, methods of intervention, it is being done actually in Afghanistan. And, it is being done. Yes. And in fact, in Iraq, I mean, Iraq is certainly no wonderful example, but there has been substantial now international engagement in rebuilding police forces in Iraq, for example, in the, ba in the Balkans, um, after the, the terrible Yugoslav wars, um, NATO and, and the United Nations, USA, all kinds of international agencies engaged in in sort of post-war reconstruction. In South Africa, I remember back after apartheid ended, for example, um, lots of international engagement in, in training their police force to be more professional. So I think that kind of peaceful third-party involvement can be extremely useful. And I also think third-party involvement can be very useful to provide the kind of protections I talked about for warring groups if they want to negotiate to guarantee that one group won't sucker the other if they negotiate. That can be very useful. Um, Another argument that was made um, after, immediately after the revolutions uh, was that these countries were able to pay for their reconstruction mm -hmm. because they are really rich mm -hmm. uh, of natural resources. Mm -hmm. So the, it wouldn't require too much of an effort on the part of international sponsors to invest mm -hmm. in the reconstruction of these countries. <coughs> the they would be able to, to pay for their own reconstruction. I agree, and I also think that, that, um, that both NGOs, particularly NGOs, can be very helpful in um, partnering in, in legitimate ways, ways that the local population thinks are legitimate, with civil society in countries, um, in providing resources, information, expertise, sometimes money. This can be problematic because it can also, that external support can, be, can discredit civil society, a civil society organization. It can be discredited if it's seen as getting funds or support from elsewhere. But there are the networks of relationship between NGOs outside a country and inside are growing. This is kind of a part of the global process. And I think that can also be very helpful. That, to me, would be crucial in parts of the Middle East um, to develop those kinds of networks. So I, I would really argue, by and large, for, for soft power um, and not so much for for armed intervention or and smart power and smart yes. power, yes. Um, but again, every situation is is quite different. I think here again, one of the problems with American engagement in this part of the world has been that we've it's been it's been heavy-handed. We've either been um, uncritical supporters, propers up of dictatorships because we needed their oil and we wanted to maintain this balance of power with the Soviet Union in the Cold War. Or we, you know, destroy a country, as in the case of Iraq, uh, and then discover that, you know, it's very difficult to rebuild a country politically. And an external um, engagement is probably not going to succeed. So I do think there are more subtle ways of which I think on which we're, we're agreeing, and I, I think many of them will have to be used in this part of the world. Do we have time for one more question or comment? I think. Um, so I was thinking, you know, talking about Britain and the third party, even for the purpose of uh, negotiation, you know, like you said that there is lack of trust and uh, you know, mutual security between the opposing parties. But then how can we guarantee that, you know, the opposing side, oh, not the third party, but the side, you know, that they will have this uh, trust for the part for the third party that they will not think that it's likely to favor any of the yeah. that's an absolutely fantastic question there's a whole kind of rational choice literature about this and because it's a super question and it's a real problem um, 
the third party or third parties have to be trusted or else they don't qualify. And this is one of the reasons why uh, the United States is now a little bit, I'm afraid, less able to be useful in parts of the Middle East than it used to be. Because it's, it, you know, <coughs> our sort of um, pretty much uncritical support for Israel now is highly problematic throughout the region. And that paints us as a potential interlocutor and, and partner, um, guarantor, um, in Middle East conflicts. It's been a real, a real problem. Um, so I would say that the search, though, has to be for third parties who are trusted. So that's why, actually, in the case of the chemical weapons issues in Syria, even though I don't think the current Russian proposal will work, I think there are too many logistical problems in locating and destroying these chemical weapons. But I think it's very, very, very helpful. Because the, the, Russia is trusted by the Assad regime, and we are trusted, the United States, by the opponents, many of them at least, not all. Um, and so that is potentially beneficial. I'll give you another example, which is from outside the region. It's, a, it's an example I've done a lot of work on in Northern Ireland. Um, in Northern Ireland, you know the Catholics and Protestants, which is too simple. But to, to simplify, Catholics and Protestants, you know, in huge, um, uh, um, really, war for years. It comes, this whole uh, Northern Irish conflict is brought slowly to an end. Um, in large part because the government of Margaret Thatcher in Britain decided that that it, it that really something had to change, um, and so brought in the Republic of Ireland as a partner in peacemaking processes in in Northern Ireland, and the the government of Ireland was trusted by the Catholics, the Social Democratic and and Labour Party, and Sinn Fein was trusted by that group. Catholic, Nationalists, and Republicans. And the British, of course, were trusted by the Unionist parties and the Democratic Unionists, the more Protestant. And it was the combination of two external actors, each trusted by one of the, of the opposing groups, that could then lead things forward. This was, frankly, not all about Bill Clinton, that success. It was largely, in my view, a combination of, of British, Irish, cooperation, including on the ground in policing. And so I think there are lots of creative ways of, of finding third party engagement that can be very effective. But again, it's going to depend on the case. This program is brought to you by AUBG Talks. For more, please visit us at aubg.bg talks.